So I just want to introduce myself again. Um, my name's Kristen Fletcher. I'm the um, chapter president of the Wood River chapter. And as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, Paul Reese will be discussing the Mongolian forests in an era of climate change. Uh, Paul graduated from Colorado State University with a degree in um, forest ecology. He spent uh, his life career with the US Forest Service in Colorado, the Black Hills of South Dakota, and Wyoming. Uh, he and I met uh, when he was the area ranger, or the, the really the manager of the Sawtooth National Recreation Area. And from the SNRA, he went on to um, be the regional director for both the Intermountain and Northern regions of the Forest Service, where his geographical responsibilities ran from North Dakota to Nevada. And then the last part of his career was serving as associate deputy chief or an associate deputy chief in the DC National Office of the Forest Service. And then in 2014, after a 40 plus year career with the Forest Service, he retired and he and his wife, Linda, who is also a forester, left Washington DC. And we are so lucky that they decided to move back to Haley. We are really delighted. Um, they have been a, a tremendous contribution to our community. And Paul is currently serving as our treasurer um, and he's an active volunteer in other organizations as well. In 2016 and twice in 2019, he led teams of specialists in Mongolia as part of a conservation corps working in 15 countries and comprised of retired US and Canadian natural resource professionals. So Paul, I'm going to spotlight you in, in uh, about a second and um, look forward to learning more about the Mongolian forests in an era of climate change. All right, well, thanks, Kristen. I, I really appreciate the kind introduction and uh, it, it is great to be back in the Wood River Valley, I have to say. Uh, so uh, I'm pleased to be here tonight and uh, we'll, maybe I'll just start with a little bit of background and history on my involvement in Mongolia. And as Kristen said, it started in 2016. I was actually in Boise for a public radio board meeting and out of the blue, I got a call asking if I was interested in volunteering to go to Mongolia to help them with some forestry issues. And uh, my first reaction was, oh, wow, Mongolia, I need to think about this. My second thought was, when would I ever get a chance to go to Mongolia? So I said yes. Uh, that fall, the State Department hosted two of us to go over, and uh, we worked out of the U.S. Embassy, uh, met with Mongolian officials, potential partners, and looked at a lot of their conditions on the ground. And the purpose of that trip, it was really a reconnaissance trip, if you will was to see if this conservation corps uh, made up of retired US and Canadian natural resource professionals might be able to help out in Mongolia. Uh, we had a good trip. We saw some real opportunities and uh, flew home actually on election day, November, 2016. Now, early the next year, all of our funds, all of the funds they had for us were cut as the new administration focused on different priorities. And uh, so we figured that was the end of it. Um, we didn't really get a chance to make a difference, but hey, at least I got a trip to Mongolia. So we thought that was it. But then two and a half years later, I got another call uh, early in 2019. And we learned that two nonprofits had partnered to raise the money for us to go back. So, but in the meantime, in Mongolia, people had changed, some situations had changed, our contacts had grown stale. So the two of us went back over for another reconnaissance trip early summer of 2019. And based on that trip, then I took two teams back to Mongolia late in the summer of 2019 to work specifically with the Mongolian Environmental Department and, and a number of partners there. So this talk is based on what I saw and learned during those three trips. So what I plan to do is first provide some background about Mongolia, its history, its people, and its forests, and then uh, talk about a few of the ways the country and its forests are being impacted by climate change, and, and in particular, the three most significant 
effects or threats to Mongolia's forests, which are fire, insects, and illegal logging. And as you'll see, all three are heavily influenced by climate change. And, and throughout this, we'll have plenty of time for questions. So I, I really like questions. So, and with that, I guess, oh, one other thing. I'm, I'm the first to admit I'm no expert on Mongolia. I was only in a small part of the country around the capital city, but I'll share what I saw, what I heard, and what I learned this evening with all of you. So. After saying yes, I would go to Mongolia. The first thing I needed to figure out was where exactly it is. I knew it was on the other side of the world and sure enough, it's almost exactly on the other side of the world. Uh, also, what I learned is there's Mongolia and then there's Inner Mongolia, which is part of China and they're very different. Mongolia is also the land of Chinggis Khan. And, and I say Chinggis, I always thought it was Genghis Khan because of the way it's spelled, but we got there and realized rather quickly that the Mongolians say Chinggis. So that's what we said. That's the way we pronounced it. He is a national hero in Mongolia and was an exceptional leader. In the, in the 13th century, he put together the largest contiguous empire in the history of the world. It went from Poland to Korea. It was immense. And, and think about running a government or keeping track of an empire that large before uh, any electronic communications. He was, he was quite exceptional. Uh, Chinggis Khan died in 1227 and his empire was divided up among his children and his grandchildren. And one of his grandsons was Kublai Khan. Ultimately, not too long after his death, about a hundred years later, the dynasty fell apart. And many believe, interesting enough, that it was a result of a pandemic. The Black Plague is believed to have been ultimately responsible for the collapse of the empire that he had built. By 1630, Mongolia was then ruled by the Manchus from China. And that lasted almost 600 years. In fact, until 1920, when the Russians invaded, drove the Chinese out, and established a communist government in Mongolia. And Mongolia remained under Soviet control until 1991. Then with the collapse of the Soviet Union, they declared themselves to be a democracy. And unfortunately, it took a few assassinations before they got there, but they did. Today, Mongolia is completely surrounded by China and Russia. And, and as they're fond of saying, or we're fond of saying in the embassy when we were working there, it's a young democracy trying to survive in a really tough neighborhood. Some of the other things I learned about Mongolia are that it's big. It is the 12th largest country in the world and the second largest landlocked country after Kazakhstan. Mongolia is also cold. The, the mean annual temperature is minus one degree centigrade, which is 30 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, on this map, if you moved Mongolia up north to where Erdnet was right on the US Canadian border, that's where Mongolia sits in terms of latitude. So climate a lot like North Dakota and uh, Southern Canada. It's, Mongolia is also the most sparsely populated country in the world. Population for all of Mongolia is 3 million people. So it's smaller than the state of Utah. And 60% uh, of those people live in the capital city of Ulaanbaatar, or as they commonly re refer to it, UB. And that leaves only one and a quarter million people scattered off across the rest of the country. So when they say Mongolia is sparsely populated, they're not kidding. Ulaanbaatar is, is really a modern city with a long history. It's, uh, it's tied with Moscow as the world's coldest capital. And depending on the day, it either has the worst or second worst air quality in the world after Beijing. Although you never know from this slide, this was just a beautiful day in Ulaanbaatar. Uh, that building on the right is called the Blue Sky Building. And uh, it really does dominate their skyline. 
you'll see it again in some later slides. And, and we'll talk more about Ulaanbaatar's air quality later, but uh, right now UV is experiencing unprecedented growth. When we first went there in 2016, they said half the population lived there in the capital city. When we went back in 2019, just three years later, it was two thirds of the population living in the capital city. And, and the main reason for that is climate change. And we'll get to more of that as well. Well, maybe I'll stop for a sec and see if there are any questions at this point. Is there anything in the chat? Kristen? There's nothing in the chat. I will speak very slowly in case someone <laughs> is typing and wants to squeeze something in right now. Nope, I think uh, they're ready to go on. All right, I'll do that then. So Mongolia is mostly grassy steppe with mountains and forests to the north and the Gobi Desert to the south. The grassy steppe, this is what much of Mongolia looks like. Rolling hills with grass, forbs, and shrubs. And, and lots of grazing animals out there as well. This is what the Gobi Desert looks like. And then to the north are mountains and forests. And it, which country that really reminded me a lot of Montana uh, with wide open parks and meadows, rolling hills, and lots of trees. Mongolia has 32 million acres of forest, which is uh, just 8% of their country. The orange, blue, and red on, on this map show the extent of their forests. And, and their forests are mostly larch and pine with a little bit of birch and just a very small amount of aspen. And, and since this is the Idaho Native Plant Society, I knew people would want details. So uh, the larch is Siberian larch. The uh, pines are Siberian pine and Mongolian pine, or also called Mongolian Scots pine, which is a two needle pine, a lot like our lodgepole pine. Uh, they, the birch is Asian white birch, also called Mongolian birch, and then Eurasian aspen. It's their aspen species. Although Mongolia does not have much forest, it's very special to the Mongolians. And, and, and actually that was similar to, is similar to the experiences that I had here in the US. Uh, I found the states that I worked with, the ones that had the least amount of forest seemed to care the most about their forest. And, uh, and it's always good to be reminded that Arbor Day started in Nebraska of all places. So uh, the people of Mongolia, well, uh, we just found them to be wonderful very friendly and welcoming and, uh, and just, just really a joy to be around. Deiri really wanted this picture taken because she was wearing Jennifer's hat in this picture. So she wanted a, a picture with uh, a forest service cap on. Uh, a lot of the men that we went met weren't quite as outgoing as the women for some reason. But uh, this is one of their forest rangers or one of their rangers uh, in uniform. But at the same time, the men that we met were still very friendly and helpful, especially like we were this day, lost and pretty desperately in need of directions. Um, hardly, hardly anyone in Mongolia speaks English. Um, throughout the early 90s, Russian was taught in school, but uh, that's changed in recent years and now the young kids in school learn English. We also, uh, there was a noticeable, noticeable difference in English speakers between 2016 and 2019. When we, when we were back a couple of years ago, we found a lot of young people in their 20s uh, were speaking English and, and were always really, looking forward to visiting with us when they found out we spoke English so they could try their English skills out. And one of the things I always asked them was, so knowing that they didn't learn it in school because they were too old, where did you learn your English? And the two most common answers were YouTube and rock videos. Not what I had expected at all. Um, Mongolia uses the uh, Cyrillic alphabet, which uh, 
made it a real challenge for us in terms of finding our way around and just reading signs and everything from uh, from directions to menus and restaurants. Um, so our common practice was when we walked into a restaurant, we would look at all the tables and see what people were eating. And if there's something on there looked like it was good, then we would point to that later when we placed our order in order to try and figure out what we were getting. So uh, it, people were wonderful and it really did work out quite well. Uh, the Cyrillic alphabet also made it pretty interesting with people's business cards. Uh, these were our cards from uh, some of the people that we worked with while we were there. And uh, fortunately though, everyone that we worked with had a two-sided business card. And this was one side, the other side was with our Roman or Latin alphabet and uh, frequently it was in English. So that really helped us a lot. You'll notice that top right card is uh, Mike Klecheski and he is our US ambassador in Mongolia. And uh, the, other, the other American name is on the bottom left, that's Sarah Johnson. But this, this is what their Mongolian side of their cards look like. And then this is the English side. And I, I'm kind of accustomed over the years, you go into a meeting in this country, you sit down around a big table, there's a bunch of people there and they toss out their business cards like they're dealing from a deck of cards. And in Mongolia, people always presented their cards with two hands. And for us, it was always with the English side up and face so that we could read it which I, I thought was really pretty special. But even with all of that, the names, as you can see, were pretty challenging. These are the names of some of the people that we work with. And were we not on Zoom and, and perhaps all in the same room together, I'd see if there was anybody out there that wanted to read through these names for us. But uh, since we're on Zoom, you're off the hook. Uh, fortunately though, for us, nearly everyone that we worked with had a short name. And, and that really, that made a world of difference. The Mongolian names were practically impronounceable to our, uh, our Western tongues. So, all right. I don't see anything else in the chat, so I'll keep going. For, for thousands of years, Mongolians have been nomadic herders, raising goats, sheep, yak, and their beloved horses on the steppe and in the forests and, and living in their traditional gares. These are gares. I made the mistake initially when I went there of referring to one as a yurt. And I was quickly told that yurt is a Russian word in Mongolia. And these are not yurts, they are gares. The Mongolians aren't very fond of the Russians. The gares are made of wool and the walls are typically 12 to 16 inches thick. And, and the gears really haven't changed in hundreds of years, except for now they tend to have a sheet of plastic on top of them and, and around the sides or, or sometimes canvas. And, uh, and more recently, nearly all the gears that we saw had a solar panel and a satellite dish. Inside the gares is a mix of traditional and contemporary. Um, you can see the meat hanging on the wall behind us. And uh, in the bowl uh, is uh, the traditional dried yogurt or arul, as they call it. And, uh, and we're all drinking horse milk tea. The Mongolians milk their horses and uh, make use of that milk both for tea and just for regular drinking. And then they also uh, ferment horse milk and uh, make a, a uh, alcoholic beverage out of it that's quite unique. Um, these days also, every gear that we were in had an LED light bulb hanging from the ceiling, an LED TV that you can see up against the back wall and a cell phone charger. Uh, and I, I was amazed at the cell phones. I mean, I get a couple of miles out of town, I don't have any cell service we'd be four hours drive from town and three and a half hours up any kind of an improved road 
and people's cell phones are ringing and they're carrying on conversations. It, it's, their cell phone system is amazing there. And then I just had to show you this. This is a pantry that was in one of the gares where they kept some of their food supplies and other things. A lot of the Mongolians stay out on the steppe for the winter, but many, particularly with children, will aggregate in small villages for the winter. And that's where the kids will go to school. They've got a really good education system there. Um, many go to college. A number of them had graduate degrees and uh, they often go to college in other countries, in the US, in Australia, India, and now China. China uh, is now offering free college education to Mongolians, um, generally as a way to kind of extend their influence in the area. So uh, some take advantage of it, but generally the Mongolians kind of detest the free education that China is offering them. But as you can imagine, once you graduate from college, especially if you have a graduate degree, um, you're not really excited about going back out to the steppe and living in a gare with your family. So most of those graduates then end up in UB where there's some pretty respectable high-tech jobs available for them. Uh, we did not see many young adults on the steppe, uh, but we did see a lot of grandparents raising young kids whose parents in UB had sent them off to live with their grandparents on the steppe because of the unhealthy air pollution in the city, which uh, brings us to climate change. Since 1940, Mongolia has warmed almost three degrees, more than twice the US and twice the world as a whole. And it's resulted in significant changes on the steppe. They have drought in the summer now, and an even greater factor, are the zuds in the winter. And a zud is a freezing rain and snow that gets so thick that it keeps the livestock from being able to graze and they starve to death. Mongolian winters have been characteristically cold and dry. And the zuds used to be really rare, uh, maybe two or three times in a generation. But now every four to five years, they're, they're seeing zuds. And, and not only are they more frequent, but they're significantly more severe. The 2009-10 ZUD killed 10.3 million livestock, which was all of the livestock in Mongolia, or 22% of all the livestock in Mongolia, excuse me. Uh, and this followed the 1999 to 2002 ZUD that killed 11 million livestock and lasted for three years. So with those kinds of losses, you just can't make a living on the step. And as you can see from the graph, the number of Mongolians who, who are out there has declined significantly. Um, and what do they do? They pick up their gears and their other possessions. They move into the city because they have no other choice. And so UB is surrounded by these extensive gear districts, they're called. And uh, uh, earlier, I mentioned the air quality in UB and Mongolia being cold. So in those gears, they burn whatever they can, coal, wood, tires, plastic in their stoves to keep from freezing. And uh, that combined with coal power, power plants built by the Russians with no pollution controls uh, or is the reason that UB has such horrific air quality. We were there in late October and uh, there's the Blue Sky Building. Uh, and the, the air just smelled of burning coal and rubber all the time. Uh, I came home with this incredible bronchial infection and that took about a month to get cleared up with antibiotics. And everybody kept saying, oh, it's a good thing you got here before the air really got bad. And, and indeed, it does really get bad in Ulaanbaatar. So, We've got a clip next that I'll show, which will give you an idea of why grandparents are raising their grandchildren.
So what does all this have to do with Mongolia's forests? Well, much of the forest is really close to the city. And, and although air pollution is certainly a threat, the greater threat is illegal logging and it's extensive. Trees are cut and sold on the black market in the city and where the green wood is then burned in stoves. Uh, a passenger car with the back seat taken out and loaded with wood is worth more than the annual salary of that ranger that we saw earlier. Also, to reduce the risk of being caught, they'll, they'll go farther from the city, cut trees in a remote area, and bring them back to the Gare districts. This was a truck that we saw quite a ways away, uh, the illegally cut trees that was heading towards the city. The rangers that we were with radioed ahead and, and the truck was stopped, but Mongolia is so big and the step is so extensive that uh, very few of these uh, tree cutters ever get caught. Although illegal logging is significant and even greater threat to Mongolia's forests are, are fires and insects, kind of like here. Um, and just like here, those threats have really escalated because of climate change. Fires, and this will all sound familiar to everybody who lives in the West. Fire has historically been a part of the Mongolian ecosystem, but now the problem is uncharacteristic wildfires. They're more frequent, they're more intense, and they're larger than they ever were historically. And the forests do not come back very well at all, except we found on the North Slopes. Most fires are human caused because Mongolians have not historically been careful with fire, uh, similar to Native Americans here. They don't even think about putting out a fire before they leave it. And it's just not part of their culture. And in the past, it didn't really matter. Uh, a little fire in the landscape was not a bad thing, but that's not true today. <coughs> Excuse me, insects. Here with warming temperatures, we've seen bark beetles go from endemic to epidemic. And the Sawtooth Valley in the 2000s was a typical example of what's going on all over the West. While we have our bark beetles here in Mongolia, it's defoliating moths. They have the Asian gypsy moth and the Siberian moth, both defoliators and uh, their large forests are particularly susceptible. You can see the area right up in here that's, that's been defoliated. There's another one on the left. And then along the ridge line, you can see how thin the trees are from uh, different defoliating events. The, the outbreaks can be extensive. And areas do recover somewhat better than from fire, but combined fire and insects are impacting about 10% of Mongolia's forests each year. And only about half of those impacted areas are, are even beginning to recover. So essentially they're losing 5% of their forest cover each year. Oh, I see we might have a question. Maybe I'll stop here. And see what's in there. Paul, I was just encouraging people to put their questions and comments <laughs> in the chat. Um, but okay. I do have a question that actually rolls back quite a way. So I'm sorry to take us backwards. But you said that the, um, the walls of the gears were 12 inches, did you say? Yeah, they're a foot or more thick. What, made, what do they put in there? Because um, it sounds like that climate is bitterly cold. They're made of wool. So the reason okay. they're so thick is uh, all that wool is good insulation. Ah, okay. Oh. So anybody have any questions? Um, I think, honestly, Paul, I think they're just so entranced with what you're sharing because it's pretty remarkable information. They may just be waiting to the end, so. Okay, well, I'll keep going then. So, so we've talked about, uh, illegal logging, fire, uncharacteristic wildfires, and, uh, and insect problems. And so what are some of the answers? Well, that was why, they, we, are, why we were there. And we were just getting started in Mongolia, but the solutions, like everywhere with forests, are really pretty complex. Uh, for fire, it, it's all about limited fire suppression combined with a change in the way people think about fire. Uh, like Smokey Bear in Mongolia. Uh, that's, that's really 
the most important thing that we can do is to try and reduce the number of person caused fires, uh, particularly in around some of their communities. For moths, there's been heavy chemical use in the past. Um, it's not been effective and, and it may have done as much harm as good. So the things we looked into were the use of biological controls, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis or BT, which is a bacteria that's pretty effective on the moths. And then there are also some viruses that, uh, that seem to be pretty effective at keeping moth populations in check. And, and for both, it's really sustainable forest management that's a key, coupled with successful reforestation practices for both burned areas, areas killed by moths, as well as those areas that are illegally logged. Uh, we also saw that some budget realignment is, is in order. Only 5% of their forest protection budget goes to fire and 43% to moths, which is disproportionate to impacts. And, and, and only 30% of their forest revenues go to protection. The UN says it should be 80%. And, and that's probably about right. So like everywhere, the solutions are as much social as they are biological, uh, particularly when it comes to the GAIR districts and the illegal logging. But uh, all, all of the efforts for fire, defoliators and illegal logging are, are really being hampered by our changing climate, uh, as you can imagine. So, um, Mongolian oh, flag. Yes, we, we do have a question um, from Jack. Uh, he says on the step, is there much steady wind? Would wind energy be realistic? Um, you know, I, there is not much wind. At least there wasn't on the, all the days that we were out. Um, it and I think it would it would be interesting to look at some of the hills around Ulaanbaatar, for example, which is where the energy is really needed and, uh, and see what the potential would be. I did not see a single windmill, I'll say that. Um, even out on the steppe or in some of these small villages, uh, people get their water from springs. Whereas, you know, you might think of a windmill as pumping water up from a well, but there were enough springs out there that I never even saw a windmill out on this step. That's a really good question. And then we have uh, Lisa, um, our member at large, asked a question, is grazing much of a factor? Um, we know how much it impacts our sagebrush step area. Um, how does it or does it impact um, the Mongolian step? That's also a really good question. Um, and so out on the step, it, it's, uh, People do not own individual pieces of land. Uh, it's all common ground that's shared. Historically, uh, it, it all worked out pretty well, um, but with ZUDs reducing livestock, uh, there's a lot more pressure for people to have more animals. So when a ZUD comes along, they can still stay out there and survive. So overgrazing, is becoming an issue, uh, I would say in the last couple of decades. One thing that was pretty interesting was the Russians controlled the grazing tightly. Uh, they were really strict about the number of animals that could be out in one, any one area. So since uh, the early nineties, uh, when Mongolia declared its independence, then rangeland impacts started to appear and uh, it's, probably one of the, one of the downsides of, uh, of leaving the Russian system is that uh, grazing is not as controlled as it was then. It's a bit of a tragedy of the commons. It certainly has that potential. Mm -hmm. um, so Mary, who is actually our chapter uh, uh, secretary, um, she asks, where do st students go to get college degrees in forestry? Do they stay in? Um, Mongolia or where do they go? They, they go all over. Um, I, I met a silviculturist who did his undergraduate and graduate work in Russia. Uh, they go to Poland, Germany, and, and a lot of them go to the US. 
Um, so it's kind of all over the place. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned um, that the, uh, I forget which pine it was, was a two needle pine. Um, are the cones of that two needle pine, are they serotonous? Do they tend to open with fire like our lodgepole pine cones, which would be a positive consequence of, yes. of fire? We, that's also a really good question. We, we looked at that kind of wondering how that was all going to go. And, and there's a little bit of serotony, but very little. Most of the cones are open. So that's part of the reason mm -hmm. that those forests do not recover well from fire. Mm -hmm. And are there birds like our Clark's nutcracker that um, that cache seeds from conifer trees that could help in the distribution of seeds? Mm -hmm. I not that I saw. Okay. Thank you. And then we have a question from PT. How about overstocked forest stands resulting in stressed trees? more susceptible to drought and insects and then subsequent fire. Yes, and, uh, and there, there were a lot of overstock for us. Um, and, and like here, I think historically, an occasional fire would help thin those forests out because we certainly saw some forests with larger, older trees that, that were well-spaced and not particularly dense. But uh, we also saw a lot of younger forests that were quite thick. And, and I think the, with more drought, uh, with higher temperatures and, and uh, more significant fire behavior, those forests are particularly vulnerable and susceptible where fire perhaps used to underburn and uh, not cause so much mortality. That doesn't seem to be happening as much now. And um, what is the relationship of the Mongolian people to their forests? I mean, do they get out in them? Or you may be going to talk about this, um, but I mean, do they care much about their forests? You, 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 yeah, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. They, yes, and they really care about their forests, um, be, partly because it's such a small part of their world. Um, Forests are scarce, so they're particularly appreciated. And then Ulaanbaatar is surrounded by forests, and I, I would call them mountains rather than hills. That one slide showed um, a picture of the forest with the big city in the background, and, and they take every opportunity, particularly in the winter, to get out of the city and up into the forest. Um, they have a Ulaanbaatar hiking club that we hiked with a couple of different times. And they have like 700 members and, and they go out every weekend all year round. So mm. that I said, well, what about when it's like 30 below? And they, oh, we go out at 50 below. And, wow. and part of the reason is that the air quality, the colder it gets, the worse the air quality is. Mm -hmm. The pollution just gets worse and worse. And so people are desperate to get out of the city and get a break and have a chance to breathe some clean air. Well, I remember in the Wood River Valley, um, actually years ago, when so many people burned wood for heat, um, the pollution in this valley was pretty remarkable. Um, but you had to climb up pretty high into the mountains to get above it. So is that <laughs> what they do? They they follow a trail of some sort and go to the highest mountains to get above the pollution? And UB is in a deep valley. Um, and so I think depending on how bad the air pollution is, I haven't been there in the dead of winter, but um, I, I think it, they'll go as high as they need to go to get out of it. And imagine that air pollution you described here in the Wood River Valley with, with people burning coal and old tires and, and all of their plastics uh, it, the air just becomes so toxic and so thick. It's just unbelievable. I hope that video came through okay, that people were able to get a sense of how bad the air pollution can be there in the winter. It looked awful. Just awful. Yes. It looked like the fog driving home tonight. I mean, <laughs> it really did. 
<laughs> um, so is, are there national parks in Mongolia or are, are there conservation movements? I noticed one of your business cards, it was a department of environmental something, um, but what's the political sort of orientation to these, these forests and the issues that you're describing? There, there are national parks and, and what they call national protected areas. In fact, one of the teams that I took back in 2019 uh, was a recreation and trails team because they were interested in developing trails. So to accommodate the use that they're seeing around the capital city in their forest. Um, I, historically, there weren't trails in the woods. People just went out and hiked mm -hmm. and, and along particular creeks uh, near the capital city, the use is so heavy with, uh, with a million and three quarter people in the forest being right there, that the erosion from all of that use is phenomenal. Uh, one of the first trails that we looked at was uh, probably a hundred feet wide. And the only thing, there was no soil left at all. It was just the rocks and the cobble. All the soil had washed away from all of that use, which was affecting their water supply. So part of their interest was in developing some trails so they could channel the use and then actually put trails in the right location, build them in order to stop erosion. And then we, we were just starting to look at ways to rehabilitate those overused areas as well. Well, I'm looking at um, our participant list. I see there are a number of botanists in the list. I see there's um, trail specialists here. Um, uh, there are people that I believe have traveled to Mongolia or the nearby environs. Um, so I, I invite you folks to, to ask your questions, to type them into the chat. And um, <clears throat> while you're thinking about your questions, I'm gonna ask one more. Uh, so Paul, um, that was 2019, it's 2020 two now. Um, I mean, I know uh, um, COVID must have wrecked havoc on everything, um, but is there any possibility that you'll go back? And, and I guess a, a, a parallel question is, are you still in touch with some of the people that you worked with? Yes, I am still in touch. You know, it's pretty wild. You just get on Zoom and talk to people in Mongolia. <laughs> um, it's amazing. That, it is and, amazing. And just like their uh, cell phone network, their internet connections seem to be pretty darn good. Uh, mm. we, we did plan to go back in 2020 um, with some slightly different specialists. And we were going to bring some uh, insect folks and uh, entomologists who had experience in dealing with uh, invasive gypsy moth, Asian gypsy moth in this country, and uh, and some reforestation folks, and uh, and some more trail planners and things. But yeah, COVID got in the way of that, mm -hmm. and uh, and lot Mongolia being so close to China really locked down when COVID struck. Mm -hmm. um, they were locked up tight. And, uh, and then they got the vaccine and uh, vaccinated enough people that they were starting to feel pretty comfortable. They began to open things up a little bit. And because they had the Chinese vaccine, uh, COVID just really spiked there. Uh, the mm -hmm. Chinese vaccine hasn't proven to be nearly as effective as, uh, as, as Moderna and Pfizer that we've gotten. So. Uh, so they've been through a number of waves of COVID. Um, mm. There was some talk about us going back last summer, but there was simply no way. Mm -hmm. um, they were letting people in the country briefly, but it, you had a four week quarantine that was mandatory. Once you arrived, they met you at the airport. They took you to a quarantine facility that uh, I heard described as being like an old prison. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what all it was like but anyway you had to sit in there for four weeks before you could even go out so there was wow. no point yeah. um, but we're talking about this summer and we'll see uh, hopefully we'll be able to get back 
Well, we want to be on your dance card for the next presentation on Mongolia when you uh, when you get back. Um, so PT uh, typed in the chat. He said the world, or he or she said the world's oldest national park is in Mongolia, yes. seventeen seventy eight. That's a remarkable statistic. That's right. Thank you. I was going to mention that, and then I got onto other things. But it's. Uh, I will say that. They, they certainly have issues around that. Um, one of the, and one of those issues, something I wasn't used to dealing with at all was the corruption uh, among mm -hmm. government officials. And mm -hmm. they blame that on the Russians. They say Mongolia wasn't like that before the Russians, but that mm -hmm. certainly is some of, it certainly is present now. So uh, we looked at a, at a fairly large deforested area, completely clear cut in that national reserve, uh, which is not too far from the capital city. Uh, we walked for probably an hour to get from one end of it to the other. And uh, uh, some official got bribed somewhere along the way. And, uh, and there was quite an effort to stop all of that. But uh, when, by the time they got it stopped, it was way too far gone. Mm. Um, Anne asks, um, is Mongolia dependent on foreign money for the development of needed environmental remedies? Well, they're dependent on foreign money for a lot of things. Um, Mongolia has a wealth of mineral resources and they do not have the internal industry to, to mine those. So, the Chinese have been in their mining, the Russians, and there were lots and lots of Australian mining companies that were practicing in Mongolia. They do, they do have environmental restrictions on a lot of that and on, and on many other things. They're certainly not on the order of restrictions in, that we have in this country. And, and because of the corruption, they're not always followed. But, uh, but they are there and, and everyone we talked to was pretty optimistic about the future, particularly the young people They were in their 20s and 30s. Uh, they detest the corruption and, and every one of them that we talked to was determined to do their part to bring it to an end. But uh, there, there are all kinds of organizations there uh, from the UN, um, and, and a number of nonprofits that we worked with and met with uh, that are there to help uh, put uh, good environmental practices in place in Mongolia. And they certainly are make it, making a difference, whether it's the World Wildlife Fund or uh, one big one is the Asia Foundation. Um, mm -hmm. Just a whole host of uh, worldwide nonprofits that are there to help. Hopefully, the, hopefully, Anne, that got to your question. <laughs> um, so did you find that the um, Mongolian people were open and receptive to this kind of international help on behalf of their natural world? Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they were very welcoming uh, of us being there as well. Mm -hmm. um, they were they were really a pleasure to work with. And part of our challenge was there are a number of groups there that are working. We certainly don't want to go in and duplicate what they're doing. So part of the reason we met with a lot of the nonprofits was to, to look at where we could help them make a difference, as well as working directly with the Mongolian government. Um, Mary asked a question. Um, are the goats, the images of the goats that you showed us, are those Kashmir goats? Yes, and in fact, Kashmir is a big export uh, from Mongolia. It's also, if you're there, it's a lot of great buys on Kashmir. That they're, uh, <laughs> but one of their issues is that they don't really have the facilities to process the wool, uh, turn it into yarn, and, and make garments and other things out of it. So much of the Kashmir that that they have goes to China, where it's turned into consumer items. So uh, in fact, there's a bill in Congress right now to provide some favorable uh, 
trade treatment to Mongolia and some financial assistance to where they can start uh, manufacturing their own cashmere items and, mm. and exporting them directly to the U.S. Uh, mm. without any tariffs or restrictions. So we're hoping that'll pass. I think it'll be really interesting. Um, you all can't see because I've spotlighted Paul, but um, uh, uh, if, I could, if I could show you, I have a finger puppet of um, a snow leopard that a woman I met at a conference uh, worked with the Snow Leopard Foundation, I think it was, in countries like um, Kazakhstan and some of those inner Asian countries uh, to work with them to use the wool of their um, grazing animals to create things like finger puppets or table uh, placemats or uh, really just very useful um, cottage industries and apparently because because they were they were the people were killing the snow leopard because the snow leopard was sometimes killing their grazing animals um, but they were able to develop those uh, um, cottage industries to help protect not, so I guess my question is is there some are there cottage industries that um, where people use the wood of the forest um, in products that they might sell? Not that we saw, and in fact, that was one of the things that we looked into is how to do what they call value add to uh, a number of their products, whether it's cashmere or, or forest products. Um, pine nuts are a, a big export item from Mongolia. And, uh, and it's kind of interesting if you go to Costco or someplace else to buy pine nuts, I think it's a really good idea to take a look at where they're coming from. Um, in general, most of them come from China. And, and quite frankly, like many things that come from China, you have no idea what's on those, um, what they've been exposed to, the chemicals that have been used or anything else. The Mongolians are pretty good about uh, their pine nuts and the fact that they're, they are more or less organic. They're not using any kinds of chemicals on theirs. The only, the only thing, I, that I was told you want to do because just like drinking the water, um, if you buy pine nuts from Mongolia, get them raw and then do your own roasting. That takes care of any uh, any bacteria or microorganisms that might be on them that our that our intestines aren't used to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so Rose asks a two part question: What kind of wildlife did you see? And then I'm also curious about whether there is a long wet period on the steppe or if it dries out quickly. It, uh, well, let's see, wildlife first. We, didn't, we did not see a lot of wildlife in the areas where we were. Um, and, and I'm not really sure why. Um, there, the Siberian timber wolf was in the areas where we were. And in fact, I'll go down the slide. Um, maybe, there we go. We never saw a wolf, but we did see track uh, hmm. all the time. Yeah, but, uh, you know, no deer, no elk, none of those kinds of things. Um, some fox and, uh, and, and a whole lot of marmots out on the steppe. Hmm. Marmots everywhere. Hmm. Uh, I forgot the second part of Rose's question. Yes. Oh, it was about um, rainfall. Is there a long wet period on the step or does it dry out quickly? It dries out pretty quickly and at least in the areas where we were, they just rely on rainfall more or less spread through the spring and summer uh, to provide the moisture. It really does stay green until it gets quite cold in the fall. And uh, it does get cold. When we were there in late October, it was between 12 and 15 degrees below zero every morning. <laughs> That's Fahrenheit? Yes. Ooh wee. And then there's someone with initial K, but I can't read the actual name on it. Sorry about that. Um, if there is not the infrastructure to mine and process cashmere, what is the industry or occupation that supports the capital city of Ul Ulaanbaatar? Mm -hmm. Well, UB is a really a pretty modern city. So there's a lot of high tech there. 
uh, there's a limited amount of manufacturing, not very much, but uh, just a lot of technologically based industries there with, mm. with computers and, and uh, software development. And I don't know what all those people in those buildings are doing, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it'd be like, you know, going to Boise. Okay, that's very interesting. Or probably more like going to Denver um, or mm. Salt Lake, mm. based on the size. Mm. Hmm. That raises questions about why would it be there and not in some other country, since so many of the people are in the capital city and so few outside the capital city. But, well, it looks yeah, like you've and, got more to that. I don't know. Yeah, I've it got a lot like to you, learn. <laughs> <laughs> It looks like you've got more to share with us. I saw the recommendations and I thought maybe that was the, the end of your talk. So I jumped in with some questions. I know it actually was. And, uh, and I, people often, I've asked a lot about, oh, do you see any timber wolves? And so mm -hmm. I, I stuck that slide on the end if that question came up. But yeah, there. so I guess if you'd like to know more, uh, two recommendations from my end. One is a book, it's uh, Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World. It's a fascinating read. It, it talks about Genghis Khan growing up and, and all of the things that he did to uh, both create that large empire that he had, but to manage it. And, and mm -hmm. was a brilliant thinker, introduced so many things that uh, to, to his world that we take for granted in our world. And, uh, and that book, of course, is available at the Haley Public Library. So it's, you can check it out for free. The other thing is the, it's a movie, a film, The Eagle Huntress. And if you're interested in, in a little bit more about the culture, uh, what life is like on the step, uh, you know, I really recommend this film, which is also at the Haley Public Library. And, uh, and it's about a young woman who wanted to hunt with eagles, which is something that Historically, the Mongolians have done, but also historically, it's been something that's only been open to men. And uh, her father just thought it was a really good idea. And so she raised this eagle and, and competed with it and was, uh, was one of the top eagle hunters in, or huntresses in this case, in, in all of Mongolia. And so it's kind of her story, but you get a look at what life is like on the step, uh, what life is like in a gear. And, uh, and it's, it's just a really nice film. So I would recommend that as well, if you'd like to know a little bit more, particularly about the cultural side of Mongolia. Um, we do have one, uh, one more question. Uh, I know that China turned a lot of historic grazing land to plowed ag land in Inner Mongolia. This resulted in serious environmental degradation. Did this happen in Mongolia? It did not. Um, There's very little um, what I, agriculture that we saw. Uh, and most of it was in really small areas where there was enough available moisture like along creeks and rivers to grow row crops, but very little of that. Um, one thing that if you go out to dinner in Mongolia, one thing you don't see are any green vegetables at all, not even any potatoes to speak mm. of. Um, their diet is is almost strictly meat and then mm -hmm. and things that are that include meat like my dumplings are a big thing there and it's a, it's a piece of meat wrapped in um, in dough and then either boiled or in water or oil and mm -hmm. uh, Mongolian um, food is if, if you're on the Atkins diet it's the place to be it's, <laughs> it's, it's almost all meat and all kinds of meat um, mm -hmm. I, I went into, we went into one restaurant, I pointed at a dish that I wanted to, to have for dinner, found out later that it was horse and horse is commonly eaten there. And, and it was good, I have to say. Uh, it was better than the yak we had and it was better than the beef that we had. So. 
Um, the grasses on the step, are they bunch grasses or are they rhizominous grasses? They're rhizominous and, and a lot of forbs. Um, mm -hmm. I'd say more forbs than grasses. Oh, okay. Oh. Well, and I'm not um, enough of a botanist to know what they are. <laughs> uh, so um, we'll wait just a second to see if any uh, late arriving questions um, slide in. Well, while we're doing that, I can show you one other thing. So okay. Mongolians love their horses and, and these guys are milking their herd. And uh, they always have the colt next to the mare because that's a way to get more milk. And, and for these guys, the milk all went in these giant plastic jugs mm -hmm. where it fermented. And, uh, and the drink is called Arig, but it's fermented horse milk. And uh, it's got an alcohol content that's probably a little bit higher than beer, but, uh, and is, there's, I've never drinking anything quite like it. So she is stirring the, the jug in order to bring the solids up from the bottom. And then they use the ladle and they pour it through a funnel into an old water bottle. Or I, I got an old Sprite bottle filled <laughs> with uh, Arig and, uh, and it was cost about $2. But uh, we drank some, we did not finish it. <laughs> you were polite guests. <laughs> we were. <laughs> so we have a question. Um, uh, are there plans to manage the livestock numbers? Um, and then a comment, 20 million was a Soviet standard. It's now up to 70 million. Oh, livestock? Mm -hmm. I can believe that. Um, there's talk about managing the, the step and the numbers of livestock. But I, I did not see any real concrete measures being implemented at this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the environmental organizations are looking at ways to tie assistance to better grazing management. And, uh, and I think ultimately that's gonna happen. It's gonna have to. Uh, or the system's just going to collapse from overgrazing. And I don't think anybody has any idea how long it would take to recover or if it would ever recover. Because mm -hmm. we're dealing with an ecosystem that just hasn't been studied that much. So um, I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to see some changes, but it's going to be slow and, and it's going to be painful. So is there more drought um, because of climate change or has the like distribution of water arriving on the land, has that changed? There, there is definitely more, more drought. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the reasons that they're having more fires in the summer now. It's kind of weird. You, it, the, they're getting less moisture in the summer and more moisture in the winter with the suds that's uh, really causing a lot of harm. The winters were always dry and just bitter, bitter cold. Well, Paul, that looks like the last of the, the questions so far. Um, uh, anything you'd like to say to wrap up your talk? Well, I, I, I hope that this has been worthwhile. Um, I hope that you've been able to learn a little bit from what I've shared and, and uh, perhaps appreciate Mongolia a little bit more. So, hey, thanks for doing this on a Friday night. <laughs> well, thank you very, very much. Um, we're getting uh, comments in the, in the chat. Um, uh, you know, very interesting and thank you very much. So thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, Paul Reese, thank you very much for sharing this experience in a part of the world that very few of us will get a chance to visit. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. All right, good night, everybody. Have a lovely evening. <laughs>